Praise the Lord, everyone. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. I'm going to read tonight. If you're a Bible quizzer or have children in Bible quizzing, um, you will more than likely recognize this passage. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says this, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. I want to talk to you tonight on uh, kind of an extension of the last four weeks we've talked about the full armor of God. Tonight I want to talk about um, armor versus sin, and we're going to talk about some of those things. So, dear Lord, thank you for this time together. I pray, God, that you would touch our minds and our hearts, open us up. God, I want your word to cut deep into me, separate the thoughts and the intents of my heart. Lord, Get inside of me and show me, Lord, the error of my ways. Show me the ways that I need to change. Show me how to put away the, the things that you hate and that are an abomination to you so that I can praise you and I can be clean and holy and acceptable in your sight. I pray that you do that for every single one of, one of us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, the armor of God, the full armor of God, when we wear it correctly, we've talked about this, it's designed to protect us from temptation. It's designed to protect us from attacks that are thrown at us uh, by the devil from the outside. Uh, and it seems pretty obvious that those outward attacks can and will be thwarted when we apply the armor the way that God intended it. Uh, yet a very big part of the equation, uh, a big part of our protection uh, is the working of the Holy Ghost inside of us to purify us, to, to make us what we need to be and who we need to be. The, the armor is designed to protect a sanctified vessel. The armor is designed to protect a holy vessel. Uh, the armor should protect and will protect a vessel that's dedicated to honor. Uh, it would be very difficult uh, for someone with an unclean heart, unclean motives, unclean intentions, uh, unrepentant, to just put on this armor and expect it to be effective in their life. Um, and so we're going to talk about this a little bit more because several times in the book of Proverbs, you'll notice that Solomon uh, uses numbered lists. Okay, so the, what we have here is a list with, with a bunch of different numbers, and um, it's a list of things, of course, that the Lord hates that are an abomination unto him. Uh, the words six and seven uh, are understood to mean that each item is as awful as the others. Uh, this is not a list that's gradually getting worse. Uh, this is a list of God hates all of these things. Uh, don't find yourself doing these things. Don't find these things in your life. Uh, some commentators even say that the, uh, the seventh item is the result of the first six. Uh, not everyone agrees with that. Uh, but most scholars do seem to agree that the seventh is not worse than the other six. They are all equally awful and equally uh, destructive. Um, and when this list, apparently, now I don't speak Hebrew, obviously, uh, but when this list is read in Hebrew, there's a, a hissing sound to the syllables, or, or the letter S sound to the, to the syllables. And uh, perhaps what's happening here is the writer chose to use terms that were uh, phonetically similar in Hebrew. Uh, again, this is kind of a, a poetry book of the Bible, so it could be that it was written with that intent. Uh, to have that sound uh, in those uh, syllables. Sometimes, uh, you've probably heard this uh, many times, you don't even have to go to church. Uh, you can ask somebody in the world uh, if they know what the seven deadly sins are. They may not be able to name each one, but if you say the seven deadly sins, 
people generally uh, have an understanding, and they'll tell you, oh, those are, those, those are the worst things that you could do. They might not be able to name them, but uh, it, it's kind of a recognized thing. I may refer to this as the seven deadly sins uh, throughout the message, so we understand that. Um, but again, Solomon said, here's what it is. First one is a proud look. Second one is a lying tongue. Third is hands that shed innocent blood. Fourth is a heart that deviseth evil plans. Five is feet that are swift and run into evil. Six is a false witness who speaks lies. And seven is one who sows discord among brethren. Um, I want to go through these and, and point out a few things and hopefully try and relate these to the armor of God because I believe the armor of God will protect us against the temptation to have these things in our life. It will protect us from these things getting a hold in our life uh, if we follow the Word of God. Now, pride is uh, just a predominant evil that comes with being a human. Our human flesh, it is very, very easy for human flesh to be proud. Um, it, we, it comes natural to us. It really does. Um, but actually, pride is the direct opposite of God, right? When, when the Lord put on flesh and came to this earth, he didn't do it with fanfare. Uh, he came uh, in a manger. Uh, he was uh, lowly, meek, and mild, as the song says. Um, so the opposite of God, the opposite of his nature is pride. And that's why the Bible says that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Uh, the helmet of salvation can pre protect us from having a prideful, evil look because salvation humbles us or, or it should humble us. When we realize our sin, when we realize our inability to save ourselves, when we realize this great sacrifice on the cross, a place that I was meant to go, a debt that I could not pay, an innocent Savior went there for me. That's humbling to me. That's very humbling to me to think about that. So the helmet of salvation can provide that humility uh, as the character of Jesus Christ is formed in us that says, you know what, if, if you're going to be like Jesus, you can't be proud because at no point in his life was Jesus ever proud. He had a right to be. He's the only person that ever walked the earth who had a right to say, I am this and that and everything else. If anyone ever had a right to be proud, it was him. But he chose not to. That's not his nature. So we need to guard against that with the helmet of salvation. The lying tongue, what does that do? That works to deceive people or maybe to flatter people. Uh, it's the member of our body, uh, the Bible says, that no man can tame, right? All the other things, but you can't tame your tongue. You can't, you can't really get a hold of that, and that's why we need the Holy Ghost. Perhaps, and I've been taught this my whole life, one of the reasons why the Lord chose speaking in tongues as the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Ghost is because it is that member that no man can tame. And it has to be tamed by the Holy Ghost. And when it is tamed, by the Holy Ghost, there is evidence, initial evidence is that, that that has happened in speaking in tongues. We understand the Bible tells us several different places that the tongue is what? It's set on fire of hell. That, that's pretty serious. That's pretty bad. It, it tells us that uh, the tongue speaking lies here. Well, who's the father of lies? It's Satan. Satan will use our tongue, he will use our voice if he can uh, to repeat things that aren't true. Psalm 62, 3 and 4 talks about this. It says, How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth but they curse inwardly. Selah. This is, this is how a lying tongue works, right? They, on the outside, to your face, they say nice things, right? And, and they say things to your face that they would never say behind your back. And then they say behind your back things that they would never say to your face. That's how a lying tongue works. And, and it makes you think, oh yeah, I'm your friend. I, I, I'm 
you know, you can, you can trust me, you can count on me, and then behind your back, that's how the lying tongue works. It's not just spouting lies that are obviously not true. We've talked about how Satan is subtle in the things that he does. And it comes across through these kind of lies as well. So again, the Holy Ghost that's represented in the helmet of salvation, what does it do? It tames our tongues. It teaches us not to lie. It teaches us not to speak evil. When the Lord gets a hold of our tongue, when he gets a hold of our hearts, that, that's part of that salvation that sits on our head and our mouth is in our head. And so I believe the helmet of salvation can cover that. I believe the helmet of salvation can help us. Next thing is hands that murder. This is literal, literal killing people. Uh, hands that murder destroy people that are made in God's own image. I was thinking about this. I thought, you know, there's, there's different things we could probably say, well, I'm not a murderer. I've never literally taken someone's life. Uh, but the Bible does talk about different things that we say, again, that can kill somebody, can really do damage to somebody if we're not careful. And, and we take, again, we, we, have, we, get, we get these problems in our head and we get whatever it is and it causes us to look at another person as our enemy. And it causes us to look at them and say, oh, they're, they're so bad and they're so awful. Again, someone who's just like us, someone who is as made in the image of God as you are, now you're wanting to destroy them with your words? You're, you're murdering them in your heart? That ought not be. So I was thinking about this and thought, you know, what, what part of the armor protect your hands? There was no gloves uh, in the list, but, uh, you know, you have the shield of faith in one hand and you have the sword of the Spirit in the other. And if we're doing what we should be doing, if we're living the way we should be living, and we've got this hand is full of faith, and this hand is full of the Word of God, we're going to have to set down one of those two things, or both of them, in order to kill somebody, right? With our hands. So if we keep our hands full of faith, if we keep our hands full of the Word of God, and we say, God, not what I see in other people, but I'm going to have faith and I'm going to look at them through the lens of your word. It's going to be very hard for us at that point to see another human being as our enemy. This is spiritual armor for spiritual warfare, for a spiritual enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen. So then it talks about a heart that devises wicked imaginations. And I was reading different uh, commentary on this, and it, it, what it's referring to is raging affections. Not, not a positive affection, but raging emotion. Uh, blinded by, by hate or by anger or by some other thing that causes a person to constantly be thinking up evil imaginations. Constantly be thinking of evil things. And then it pairs it with feet that are swift to run to mischief. And, and I, the picture that's in mind is people that get so angry and so bitter and they're, they're so convinced of their own righteousness that it causes them to hatch plans and then carry them out so quickly and so often that over time they become desensitized and they don't even realize that what they're doing is, is evil, it's wrong. And they're carried away by these raging affections so quickly and so powerfully that they can't see the evil in what they're doing. This is much more than just simply falling down, making a mistake, sliding into sin, because those things... Let's be honest, sometimes those things happen to all of us. This is more of like a, a reprobate mind kind of thing. This is something that when, when we allow 
those wicked imaginations to go unchecked, it has an effect on us. It's going to have an effect on you. If we don't clean those things out of our heart, it's going to get worse and it's going to get worse. And it really what it does, it turns our heart into a workshop for the devil to create things in us that he wants us to think that aren't true, that aren't right, that aren't holy. It's a mark of pure wickedness. And the reason why he tricks us with this, or the reason why he tricks so many with this, is because it's planned in secret. None of you can see my heart. I can't see any of your hearts. I can't know that. And the devil thinks, well, because they can't see what's going on with you, you don't need to worry. And he would love for us to forget that like Pastor just said a few minutes ago, that it's to God that all hearts are open. It's to him that he sees every desire. No secret is hid from the Lord when it comes to our hearts. So what protects our heart? Well, it's that breastplate of righteousness that protects without and within. Why do you think the Bible tells us to guard our hearts so often? It's allowing God's righteousness to govern what's happening in my heart. What I feel about this situation or that situation or that person or this person or whatever it might be. Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 46 says, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. And then he drops in verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? He's saying, look, you're either, you're either going to be good or you're not going to be good. You can't have the evil side of the tree and the good side of the tree. You can't, you can't have it both ways. If you're good, it's going to show forth in the things you say and the things you do. And if you're evil, that's going to show forth in the things you say and do as well. And the Lord knows because what, what happens? We, we come to church or we get around the church folk and, oh, here's my good side. And then at home when no one can see or when we're around people who aren't in church, we're, well, that's, that's my bad side that they see. And Jesus is confronting them saying, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I say? Is that not the, one of the most straight-to-the-point things that you've ever heard in Scripture? I know it is for me when I read that verse. And it applies to us. Do we do what the Lord tells us to do? Or do we just call Him Lord on Sundays and Wednesdays? Do we just call Him Lord when we're around the church folk? We can trick ourselves. We can fool ourselves. Say, oh, look at me. I'm a I'm good Christian. I made it to church this week. I, I'm doing good. And, I, and I'm, I'm holy on Sunday and Wednesday. And... I don't know, but you know. <laughs> you know whether you do the things that he says or not. Proverbs 4, 23 through 27 says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. How do we do that? It says, well, put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path 
of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. It's telling us, look, if you want to do it right, you've got to understand that there's a, a stark contrast between good and evil. Again, pastor said it not long ago. We pray for this, we pray for that. We ask for things that, that would please us. And a lot of times when it comes to holiness, when it comes to righteousness, we say, well, that's just, you know, that's just too hard for me to tackle by myself. God, you're, you're just going to have to do that for me. And yes, I believe that God changes our hearts, but he expects us, according to the scripture, he expects us, if you know something is wrong, Put it away from you. Get rid of it. When, when, when evil is shown to you in your life through the Scripture or through the preached Word of God, deal with it. Deal with it. Get rid of it. Moving on. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Walk circumspectly. They don't run off to evil without even considering the direction they're going. They're not blinded by ambition. The peace of the gospel teaches us to walk in the light as he is in the light. Lips that speak lies, or perhaps a more accurate translation is lips that breathe out or habitually speak lies. Ever hear someone say, oh, how did I know they were lying while their lips were moving? That... This is kind of the more accurate translation here. Breathing out lies. You breathe in every time you breathe out. They're, they're breathing out lies. This is bad. This is a problem. And what these lies do, according to commentators that studied out these words and the different uh, original meanings, they're, they're saying that it's, it's perjuring, like committing perjury, right? It's perjuring the innocent and excusing the guilty. That's what these lying lips do. The lying witness corrupts and oppresses and then suppresses the truth. The Hebrew word used here involves spinning or nodding or painting or deforming. It's lies that twist and tie up and cover up and deform the truth. Lips that speak lies. That's how, that's how they do it. But if we have our loins girt about with truth, that's what prevents us from reproducing something that's evil, from repeating something that isn't true, from, from, from doing that thing that maybe everyone else has fallen for it. But if we're wearing the armor like we need to, it will guard us. It'll, it will prevent us from spawning lies it teaches us not to distort the truth, not to bend it, not to dress it up. Truth is enough by itself. It teaches us to declare God's truth purely and to live by that truth in everything that we do. Next, I guess, uh, or last, you could say, sowing discord among brethren. This is something that's really it's diabolically evil when you really break it down because what it does is it takes and it destroys harmony in people's lives. It destroys the harmony of, in a family. It destroys the good things that are happening uh, in, in friends or in a church setting. It works to destroy unity among people who ought to live together in brotherly affection. And that discord, that thing that's being planted is designed to split churches, to destroy the peace of spiritual communities. And again, I think of this, well, what part of the armor does this relate to? Well, it's seeds that we sow with our hands and with our words. It's a lifestyle. Well, what we reproduce, what we're planting, what we nurture in our life, what we're speaking in our life, We've talked about how the armor can protect us 
in those things and purify our deeds and the working of the Holy Ghost in us that causes us to say, you know what, is what I'm, is what I'm saying going to divide or is it going to bring together? Is it going to tear something down or is it going to build something up? And if we're wearing the armor, we're praying like we should, and we're letting the Holy Ghost work in us like we should, we won't have time to sow discord. We won't have time to tear people down. Because remember, we talked about this armor and standing back to back with someone, right? Having someone's back. Standing side by side and understanding that if that person next to me falls, I'm in much greater danger now because I'm no longer protected on that side. But when we talk about each other and when we tear each other down, we're working with the enemy. We're working against ourselves. It's really what we're doing. Proverbs 16, 27 through 30 says this, An un- ungodly man diggeth up evil, not just sowing discord, he also digs up some stuff too, and of course none of it's good. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is as a burning fire. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. A violent man enticeth his neighbor and leadeth him into the way that is not good. He shutteth his eyes to devise froward things. Moving his lips, he bringeth evil to pass. This is wicked. Discord among brethren is wicked. It's not just bad. It's something that the Lord hates. It's an abomination to him. It strikes me that all of these seven deadly sins are connected to something we do Uh, either in ourselves or through ourselves. The eyes have the proud look. The tongue does the lying. The hands are used to commit murder. The heart devises evil plans. The feet run to evil. People lie and misrepresent facts, and people work to divide families and friends based on their own evil agenda or the agenda of Satan, perhaps more accurately. All these things are done through our weakest point to the point where Satan has the easiest access into our life, and that is our flesh. And we're again reminded of what Paul wrote in Romans about presenting the parts of our body or our members to God for the work of righteousness, not for the purpose of sin. That's in Romans 6.13. And I'm also struck by the fact that this collection of seven sins is not just focused on how it destroys us. In fact, it's more focused on how it destroys other people by us and through us. And these seven deadly sins should and are designed to cause us to focus on how we interact with other people. We need to learn to honor God and to worship Him in spirit and in truth and to honor him in our interactions with people, with each other. It's hard to praise God and then turn around and abuse each other. You can't have poison water and drinkable water from the same fountain. Each of these seven sins are very, very serious sins not only against God. Yes, he hates them. Yes, they're an abomination. And perhaps the reason is it's kind of a two-for-one deal. The devil's using us to destroy someone else. So Not only are we sinning, we're taking someone else out, out at the same time. Perhaps that's why God hates it so much. It's also interesting to note that these deadly sins are mental, Verbal, and then actual, show up in our actions. These are sins that work in us and are manifested through us by our words and by our actions. One commentator said this, 
These things which God hates, we must hate in ourselves. It is nothing to hate them in others. Well, so you see someone else that has a problem? How, how is you hating that in them going to help you? It's not. Don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> it goes on and says, let us shun all such practices and watch and pray against them and avoid with marked disapproval all who are guilty of them, whatever may be their rank. And it starts by looking at ourselves and saying, God, are any of these things present in my life? You know, I, I was looking at these seven deadly sins, and the more I studied them, the, the heavier my heart became. Because it's real easy, you know, we've been around church we, for a long time, we've heard this stuff. And we all know sin is bad, right? Don't, don't sin, sin is bad. But sometimes we gloss over and we, we go over these things that maybe we've committed to memory. Uh, maybe we think, well, it's not applicable to me because I have the Holy Ghost. When you look really closely at these things, it, it was not something new that Proverbs was bringing out. When you compare the seven deadly sins, it sounds an awful lot like the Ten Commandments. When you sit down and put them side by side, because I did this and I looked at it and I thought, huh. Same problem then, same problem now. Well, we're serious about the Ten Commandments, right? We know well, you, don't, you, don't, you don't break the Ten Commandments. Well, these seven deadly sins are directly related. If we learn to keep those commandments, we won't have to worry about these seven deadly sins. We said it earlier, but we really don't have to look any further than ourselves to know that human nature makes these seven sins very easy to commit. Our sin nature doesn't need much encouragement from hell to commit these sins really easy for our flesh to sin in these ways. And so with it, naturally the question becomes, how does a person go right? How do we do right? And it's more than just saying, well, you need to be saved, you need to repent, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. Yes, we need to do those things. And we daily strive to live a holy life. Psalm chapter 15 says this, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Not evil imagination, but speaks the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but... He honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. That's Old Testament. We can say, well, all this stuff we're talking about is Old Testament. Well, the Apostle Paul said something very similar to the New Testament church. Be careful of the same sins that were mentioned in Proverbs that we Spent a lot of time talking about Romans 1, 28 to 32 says this. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Friends, I would argue that this is the seven deadly sins in action in the New Testament. In the New Testament, what is a backbiter? What, what does that word mean? It, 
I looked it up. It means to defame. It means to slander somebody. If you're a backbiter, you're an evil speaker. Later in Romans, Paul echoes Psalms 15 as he tells Christians how to live. He says, I see these problems. We know that these problems are real and they're active. And he says, if you want to make it right, if you want to live the right way, Romans 13, 8 through 14, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. New Testament church, believers, Holy Ghost filled, baptized, our brothers and sisters, this is for us. He's saying, look, all these things that we know are present, it's time to wake up. It's past time that we recognize. It's time for us to put these things away. It's time to get rid of those garments that are spotted by the flesh and spotted by the world and put on the armor of light. It's time to be who God called you to be. It's time to stop making room for the flesh. It's time to stop making room for the devil to trip us up with the things that we say, with the things that we imagine in our hearts. We're making his job too easy because he hears what we say. What we say. You know, I don't believe the devil can know your heart. He can send thoughts your way. He can try and put stuff in there. But he can't really know your heart until you say something. And when he hears you talking bad about your pastor, talking bad about your brother or sister, talking bad about this person, that person, real easy for him then. He can recognize that that's not right for us to do. Uh, yeah, oh, that's your problem? I'll pour gas on that. I'll feed you more of that. I'll help you with that. I'll help you stumble that way. I'll help you fall. Put it off. Get rid of it. Don't make room for it. Don't give the devil a foothold in your life. The book of James, the pastor was close to quoting this one as well. I think he was in a different chapter, but the book of James is a fantastic meat kind of book for mature Christians only. <laughs> uh, it, sobering instruction. James is telling us we need to take this battle seriously. We need to recognize that one of two things is going to happen. Sin will destroy us or we will get rid of sin in our lives. You'll either put it away or it'll put you away. There's no two ways about it. James 4, 7 through 12 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Verse 12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? 
It's not just necessarily talking about judging another person's actions. I read this in a different way, maybe saw it this way for the first time. It says, he that speaketh evil of his brother. Not just someone who sits back and points out the flaws in everyone else. Of course, that's not good either. But it says the one that speaks evil of his brother is judging that person. And we're make, I make myself a judge, which is not my position. Who am I? I'm not the one who saves you. I can't save a person. It's not my job to judge. It's not my job to speak evil of my brother. Speaking evil of someone is judging them. We ought not do that. I'm closing if you'd like to stand with me. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read some verses from this. This is a passage of Scripture that keeps coming back to me from the very beginning of this series. It says this, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Christians, church, we've been called to liberty. Jesus has made us free. We are designed to be free. That's what he's given us. And it says, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. Don't use your liberty to say, well, I'm going to do this, and it's just because I have Christian liberty, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, and I'm going to do all these things that really aren't right, but, well, I have Christian liberty, and, and think that we can get away with that. That's not what it's for. That's not what it's about. Our liberty is to serve one another. Verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And verse 15, but if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This is that backbiting. This is that thing where it's so easy to talk about this person. It's so easy to point out that person and what they're doing wrong. Sometimes we do this stuff, we don't even realize it. And this, this warning in Scripture is, is profound to me because I've, I have uh, friends of mine, people that I've known, one time we're saved, one time we're in the church, and have since backslidden. And I've had conversations. And I prayed and I said, God, what, what is it? And there are many things that can cause someone to backslide. It's, it's usually never just one thing. It's a, it's a lot of things. The one that I talked to said it, it was backbiting that hurt me so much. And you can say, well, they're just blaming that on someone else. And yeah. I, I get it. When people backslide, it's real easy to blame the church, right? It's real easy to say, well, you didn't do this for me or you weren't there for me for this, whatever it was. It's, I understand. But there's a point to backbiting. There's a point to it, and it's saying, be careful. Be careful. It's real easy to say, well, revival's happening and people are coming into the church. But be careful. That person that you're talking about that you don't think they know, be careful. As you destroy them, you're destroying yourself. If you're going to bite on them, why don't you just bite on your arm? Why don't you gnash on yourself for a while? See how it feels because that's what we're doing. When we talk bad about each other, we don't even realize it, but we're killing ourselves. Oh, well, it's just one person. Oh, well, I'm justified in saying that. Well, I'm justified in feeling that and thinking that. The 
You're destroying the body. You're not just consuming them. You're consuming yourself. We're consuming our own body, our own church, when we backbite. And saying, be careful. Make note. You're going to consume yourself. We're going to consume ourselves without even knowing it by backbiting. So what does he say? Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If the seven deadly sins are present in our life, the word of God says we won't inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What I'm preaching or teaching to you tonight is that it doesn't matter. We talked about this in weeks past. It doesn't matter how how much of the armor you have. It doesn't matter how good you make it look. If on the inside we're not right, And it can be hard to tell because sometimes there's people that they seem to have great faith or they seem to have a great grasp on the Word of God or they're filled with the Holy Ghost so we know they've got that helmet and they've got that shield and they've got that sword. But there might be a piece of armor that's missing. Their heart might be exposed. They might not know how to walk in peace yet. They might not have really and truly put on the whole armor of God. Our job is not to point them out. Our job is not to judge them. Our job is to pray for them as if our own life depended on it. The armor is not meant, you could you can make the argument that the armor is not meant to protect us from attacks from behind. If we have things in us, things causing us to attack each other when our focus should be on the direction that God puts us, then we have a problem that needs to be dealt with. The seven deadly sins are not just some interesting rhyme. It's not just some Old Testament thing. All these things are working to destroy you and to destroy me and to destroy us actively today. I'm here to encourage you and to help you and to learn myself as I teach this and as I study this. That the Word of the Lord has to be the ultimate authority in our lives. We have to return to the place where we say, you know what, God, if you say that sin, I'm getting rid of it. I'm getting it out of my life. Yeah, I'm going to pray if I see it in someone else. I'm not going to backbite. I'm not going to go tell my brother or sister about it. I'm going to tell God about it. It's not that you can't tell anyone. Just tell God. Tell God how much you hate that person. 
Tell God how bad they are. Attitude changes pretty quick in prayer, doesn't it? It's really hard to accuse someone before God, isn't it? When we have a problem, don't take it to your brother or sister with the intent to hurt somebody. If you can't say it without trashing somebody else, don't say it. It's time to know the voices in our life. It's time to understand who and what is influencing us. It's another, I guess it's another message. It's in another, another entire set of scriptures. But we're instructed to save ourselves. If you're not influencing that person, keep praying for them, but step away. If they're influencing you, if they're unrepentant, the Bible tells us exactly how to deal with that. It really does. We, we don't preach it much. We don't talk about it much. But these seven deadly sins, if we're not careful, they're going to work real hard to undo what God wants to do in our church, what God wants to do in our life. Any way that he can, he'll find a way to trip us up if we're not careful. It's time for us to examine ourselves. It's time for us to look at our lives. It's time for us to say, okay, God, let's really get this right. I want to fight a good fight. I want to war a good war. I want to stand at the end of my life and say, God, I wasn't perfect, but by your grace, I was always growing. I was always trying. God, protect my heart. Put a, put a good heart in me that works to see the best and to do the best. I want to pray as we close. Dear God, your armor is right. It's perfect. It is effective. It will protect us against every sin that comes against us, any attack of the enemy. God, I pray that you would bring your word to our mind. I pray that your word convicts me. Let your word cut deep inside of me and point out the places where I'm wrong, the places that I need to change. Show me the evil that might have crept in that maybe I don't even realize and help me to understand hurting someone else hurts me. Help me to understand Lord, that the, the, the lying tongue and the, the feet that run to evil and shedding innocent blood, Lord, that doesn't please you. Those are things that you hate. Those are abominations to you, God. I pray, God, that you'd help me to examine myself, my actions and my words, and see whether I'm helping others or whether I'm hurting them. God, show me. Help me to get to a place where you can speak to me and say, I'm, I'm pleased with you, child. I'm pleased with the way that you're living. I see your heart. I see your efforts. And God, I pray for our church that you would bind us together. Help us, Lord, to look to you, to encourage and strengthen each other, to fight on each other's behalf. Mighty God, I pray, Lord, that you'd raise us up and help us to walk more and more in your word and in your truth. Mighty God, your ways are perfect. Your plan is perfect. And we thank you for your working in our lives. Lord, protect us and keep your hand upon us. Let your spirit reign and rule in our lives in every part that we can not only be saved, but be overcomers and conquerors and warriors that have success in the Holy Ghost in this life, in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you. I know Pastor mentioned there's a meeting for the men uh, directly after service here. I don't know if the other classes are done, but uh, men, keep that in mind.
Otherwise, God bless you, and we will see you on Sunday.